Speaking podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you for, oh, I don't know, show 100 and something or other. And I am joined today, uh, when you are seeing me here on YouTube, you can see when I have guests. And, uh, and this week we have uh, Fernando Alcantar. And I'm you know, again, always butchering names, but I, I hope I got that relatively right. Welcome, Fernando, to the show. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Yes, I really, <laughs> I really appreciate your time on this. I think this is going to be an interesting discussion. Fernando is a, uh, I'm pulling this from his website here, which is called uh, gospelofreason.com. And he is a former high-profile evangelical missionary leader. Now, he is a gay atheist, atheist activist, and he's the author of the book, To the Cross and Back, An Immigrant's Journey from Faith to Reason. And he does uh, youth motivational speaking on issues of diversity, advocacy, and activism, which sounded like it was right up my alley on having, it on, having him on our show here. So, uh, so much to talk about. Uh, so let's just dive right into this and get going. First off, why don't we um, give folks a little background on where you've been, what your journey has been here, and what it is that you are trying to accomplish now. Well, Chris, once again, thank you for uh, having me and for everyone uh, listening and viewing. Guys, I hope I get to meet you sometime. It's great to, 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 to talk about this message that I have uh, within me. Uh, you know, part of my story, a uh, short version, I was born and raised in Mexico. I spent most of my childhood uh, there up until I was 18. Uh, and then I moved to California. Uh, and uh, while I was in California, that's when I full-on converted, uh, made a transition into uh, Christianity. At the time when I made that change, I was going through a lot of uh, very deep uh, troubling issues. I was having a struggle with depression, suicidal tendencies. Uh, I was in a very lost uh, place and uh, religion was approached, uh, was given to me as a way to kind of get out and escape route uh, per se. I, you know, I came in looking for a family. Uh, in that process, I eventually became a, um, a, a, a leader, a state leader for the Force War denomination. You know, uh, if you know, it's a very kind of Pentecostal uh, group, tongue speaking, uh, you know, demon casting, shaking in the spirit kind of denomination. Very uh, scary at first, you know, but looking for family, I went into that. Um, and that's, uh, I did that for uh, several years. And then I was accepted and transferred into Azusa Pacific University, which is the second largest evangelical college in the nation. And while I was there, I worked uh, there for eight years at their missions office or so. And there I, I you know, helped mobilize thousands of people into, uh, first of all, New Mexico and then around the world. Uh, and we coordinated a lot. I, I was in charge of like being the mediator and started a lot of ministries fo uh, focusing on helping kids, working in prisons, rehab centers, uh, hospices, uh, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of things connected with the government, construction, you know, fixing parks, homes. Uh, and then after time with that, I moved and became the, the head of youth and adult ministries for the Foursquare denomination for the Haw uh, California, Hawaii region. And there, the same thing, oversaw youth ministries and young adult ministries across the region. It was towards the end of that that I kind of, I finally forced myself to deal with all the questions that I had because basically for the last 10 years, uh, for five years, it was kind of like this honeymoon-ish uh, period. And then for 10 years, it was like, okay, hold on. There's a lot of doubts. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. But I guess... Now, again, in retrospect, and I cover this in more detail in the book, I realized that I was always looking for hope. And I kept telling myself, you know what, which is one of the things that people tell themselves in faith, someday it'll make sense. Someday it'll make sense. And I was like, okay, that day has not come. So when is it going to come? And I went through another very difficult period. Again, it was depression, anxiety, uh, to the point that I had to check myself in the hospital with depression because I was literally thinking I was taking my own life. Uh, and I just couldn't do it. And that forced me through a reconnection with, with the reason part of me that I had betrayed for a while. And eventually that led me to leave it. Uh, once I left that, I left all that, left Los Angeles for a period. And then I found myself in Utah uh, and then working for a college there. Well, that happened with religion away. I realized, oh my gosh, there was this other part of me that has kind of been there speaking voices, but I didn't let it because... Religion always told me it was bad, and that is the fact that I am gay. 
And uh, that was another, again, you know, earth shattering kind of change in lifestyle and life. Uh, that didn't go so well because I did it in, you know, in the Mormon epicenter of the world, and that is in Utah. And the Mormon community had a lot of issues with me being what I called a atheist. First of all, they have a they have a phrase in their uh, scripture. You know, it's not just in the Book of Mormon; it's also in the Bible. Um, but it's called the son of perdition, and they use this term to refer to people who had been touched by the spirit before, and they left them behind. Not only that, but also they teach people that being gay is the same thing as being a pedophile. So you combine those things, and I was persona non grata. I was public enemy number one. A lot of the comments that I got is like, I was very, I hate using the word popular, but people, uh, the kids like me a lot. I worked out of college. Uh, and people said, Fernando, you cannot be popular liked and, and not Mormon and get away with it. And eventually that ended up badly. So I had to leave uh, Utah after attack, after attack, and attack that I was receiving. And uh, for a pre uh, period there, that's when I started writing the book, um, also as a way to deal with the pain that I had inside. And uh, eventually decided, you know what? Uh, most people, at least it seemed like the story that I've seen from people that were like me or that have gone through things like the ones I went through, they had two options, it seems like. One, honestly, and as I hate saying this, but it's kill themselves. The If you see, look at the statistics, gay teenage Christians have some of the highest, if not the highest rate of suicide in our country. That idea, you know, like, oh, but the Bible says this, but I feel like this, and they find no point in between. And number two, is lock themselves in the darkness and plan revenge. Uh, and to me, the way I saw it, I just didn't have it in me to add to either one of those. You know, I want to think about my family. I want to think of the future. So when I finally, the book came out, you know, to the cross and back, and I'd been speaking around, my message has been different. I realized in my life that I didn't want to add any more fuel to the fire. I just didn't want to be part of adding more casualties, be it mental, physical or emotional. And I decided, I decided, you know what, I'm going to be option number three. Let's, let's, let's reach out uh, to people because at the end, for me, my humanism is very simple. It's about improving and saving lives. And if you're not part of those, then what the hell are you talking about? Uh, you know, I, we can march all we want. We can write a paper all we want, but at the end, if it's not going to improve people's lives, then you're just doing it for show. You're just doing it to like get more anger out, and that's really not going to benefit anyone. Well, I can agree with a lot of that. Absolutely, I uh, I, I feel, um, in fact, very similarly motivated, <laughs> uh, having come out of Scientology and and realizing that you know that there was a lot of people talking about a lot of things and not a lot of people doing, uh, you know, the things that necessarily need to be done. You know. Uh, in fact, that's what kind of got me out of Scientology. In fact, was it was all about the money, and it wasn't about actually helping people. So um, now, what? Let's talk about uh, in terms of having come through this journey that you have, and it's and it's been quite a struggle. I can see. Um, you also be you know you didn't just realize that you were gay, but that also you converted to atheism from from a position of a lot of faith, a very strong faith as a, as a, a motivational speaker and, and, uh, and missionary. So what, how, how did that work? Like what did you, did you lose faith because of the tenets of, and the behavior of people of faith towards you? Or was there something else with the actual principles and, and, and dogma? Well, a couple of things that I would say uh, before going to the story that, at least for me, I usually don't use the, not that it means anything, the phrase like convert it into atheism. You know, like they say, uh, atheism is not an other sure. religion, but just the absence of. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I basically, I deconvert it uh, from, uh, you know, from religion. And second to add to that is, I'm actually very happy that I deconverted from religion before I realized, because I, I have, uh, you know, when I came out, there was a lot of, there was a controversy, you know, from the religious world because I was very involved, very kind of high up there. And uh, so people have been saying, oh, it's because, you know, he has this trouble, so the devil's working with him, that he's, uh, in, or, in order for him to accept that he was, you know, demon possessed. So, you know what? Uh, so I'm actually glad uh, because for me, it was something that didn't make sense. But I remember, and I talk about this also um, in, in, in the book, that I realized that even though I had left religion for, at that point, 
would have been uh, a year, year and a half or, or two uh, between that, that I left it when I started realizing the, oh my gosh, you know, kind of moment, I realized that all that baggage that I've had for the last forever, um, you know, it had been there because I was told in Mexican macho Catholicism that, you know, um, there's nothing worse than, and I quote, being used like a woman, you know, and I get this, you know, this misogyny that is in, instilled in that cultural, you know, in that re cultural religious or that religious culture. And uh, that was like, you know, who, that, that's disgusting. You know, those are terms that I, that, that I was told. Then, and uh, when I was part of the four square denomination, when I was at this Pentecostal uh, preacher, they told us very often um, that homosexuality is an abomination as is, is found in, in, uh, in the Bible, that, uh, that God had created AIDS as a punishment for homosexuals, you know, for their sin. And they even, you know, preached that the there was a possibility that um, AIDS was caused when men had sex with monkeys, you know, an extension of their sinful desires for one another. Uh, then when I attended Azusa Pacific University, I, in my abnormal psychology class, I was taught that it was something called gender identity disorder, that it was caused by the sins that I had committed or sins that, was com that were committed against me. And then I, when I go to the United Methodist Church, when I go in, literally, um, the denomination was going through this huge conversation about homosexuality, and they were saying that it was going to be the issue that was going to divide the denomination in half. And so I have all this baggage, right? Even though I had left religion behind, that is still within my mind. Like all these ghosts, you know, all these demons, probably using the word, like they were just there haunting me because I realized I left it, but that was still part of me. Like I, I was still carrying these cultural chains. So when I'm confronted with the question, I realized the reason why I'm saying no is because of all that crap that I had from behind. And it was a very difficult, I mean, there were a lot of tears. There was a lot of, and I had, you know, I had said like a lot, it was a lot of me just honestly just hugging the rug and being like, I can't, I can't. And at the time I'm in Utah when there was a no one around me. I have no friends. I have no family. I'm on a brand new place. I left everyone behind. No one even to call. Uh, and it was incredibly scary. And granted, even one of the reasons why I wrote the book that I wanted people to see. You know, I picture my, and I've heard that actually has happened, that, you know, kids or whatnot that just they can slide the book across the table and be like, mom and dad, you know, here's a book that tells you how I felt because it's incredibly, incredibly scary. It's a very lonesome, you know, moment. And, uh, and if you tell me what, if, if I have any regrets or any anger or any, you know, uh, there's two things, you know, that come to mind when it comes to all that one. And yes, I accept it. I have not been able to heal from it. Is this incredibly deep, feeling of loss time because I spent three decades of my life of my life buried in this, you know, dogma and who to, who knows, like I might've met the man of my dreams, but I couldn't do it because this whole dogma was just pulling me. No, no, it's dirty. It's some abomination and so on and so forth, you know? Uh, so it's that. And then second, it's honest, this honest anger. I try to be as positive, positive as I can. And I understand religious freedom and, speech and so on and so forth, but we have to be very cautious that that particular freedom does not equate with preventing people from finding themselves because I was one of the lucky ones. I was able to get out. I was able to find myself granted a little bit later in the game, but if I can, and I'll try my darkness, so young people who come behind us, they don't have to go through that as well. Yeah, it's rough getting out of a situation like that and the anger. I definitely understand that. And, and, and yet you and I also have come to a place where we, where we do preach religious tolerance and, and attempts to, <clears throat> to build bridges, to, build, to, to cross those divides that people seem bound and determined to create uh, because of their religious belief or because of their lack of religious belief, because you get it on both ends. What's been your experience with that? Having come out of a religious community or communities, you know, all these groups you were involved with and the, and the amount of time you've spent working on that. Now you're, you know, working in the atheist community. What has been your experience there? I'll say, I'll start with by giving you an example. 
uh, here at the school uh, uh, where I work now, I created an event, a large event called Global Week, and you see the poster there to the right, it's long. And basically, it's a week-long series of events that deal with diversity, social justice issues. And uh, every year, one of the things that I do, I put together programs related to you know, religious uh, communication, and we have people from Christianity, from Islam, from uh, you know, um, Hinduism, uh, so, uh, and, you know, and, and I've been the one that, uh, Christianity obviously, that includes um, uh, the humanist uh, pop, uh, population. And to give an example of this, last year we talked about, uh, you know, supposed misconceptions, and we were able to talk about like what each religion views about certain issues, and I included the area of, you know, gay rights, the LGBT community. And to me, it was a very, it was two sides to the same coin, because one, I was happy. Hey, guys, we can have people from a, you know, array of a belief or not lack of belief and be able to talk like adults, be able to have a good conversation, respectful, you tell me, you tell me. Uh, but the other side of the coin is also a, a lot of pain. And this is something that I think, I'm very honest with the atheist community, it's not that I don't have any, you know, pain or whatnot from the religious community, but I, why, what do I mean when I say, I don't want to add fuel to the fire? So I'm talking to this group, uh, you know, the, class, the, the room is full and I have this conversation, I'm talking to the leaders and I tell them, um, you know, like, I, like the story that I was telling you, there was these two doors and I created the third one. And I'm listening to this one student uh, in front of the whole group, one of the, the leader of the Christian fellowship. And he says that he wishes the Bible didn't say so, that, he, that the Bible is against uh, homosexuality. He says, but, I, but the Bible says so, so I'm still going to do it, you know? So it's like, okay. But in the way I see it for me is that every big change, including my personal change, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, there was a, for me, it was a process of at least 10 years of deconversion. So I know that for now, when I'm talking to all these people, I know that mentality, if mine didn't change overnight, there's no way that someone else's mentality is going to change, you know, like the same way. So I'm thinking to myself, this is the process. And I kid you not, like this particular group with Christian Fellowship, they know I'm out as a gay theist. They know that, but nonetheless, it's an incredible friendship because they know I will listen and that they will listen. And I know that in this conversation, the views that they had uh, that were taught very, you know, biased and very limited, they're kind of those models or biases that they were taught, they're changing because they're meeting someone who's different. Because here's the, you know, here's the, the, the no final note on this one. People are not going to change their minds and they're not going to change their hearts because you shout at them, because you curse them, because you tag their doors, because you, you know, whatever, they're not going to happen because of that. The change will come because they met someone. If you look at statistics, if you look at politicians, most people that have changed their minds regarding this issue is because they met someone who lived in that situation, because their kid came out, because their father, neighbor's cousin, someone came out, and they realize it. So I want to be that story. I want to, here's my story, not just within the book, but the one that I preach, you know, when I go out. Here's someone who has that story. Know me, know my name, know my background, know my pain for crying out loud. And that can give you something else that just is different than what you've read about from, you know, thousands of years ago. Right. Now, in the, and, and that's good, that's perfect. On the, on the atheist side, um, I want to switch gears for just a second and ask you about something else related. Um, you... You are obviously not shy. You're not introverted. You're not like pulling back. You are out there. You are, you know, you're. So I've heard. Yeah, and that no, and these are all very, very good things. Um, there are people in the atheist world. Let's talk about this community for a second. Who come out of religion, right? Like you have, bitter, upset, angry uh, at the wasted time, at the lies, at the at the you know that that they now feel. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm not trying to you know, deride people who have faith and say, well, it's all just a big lie and, and you're an idiot for believing it. What I'm saying is that people who come out of religion feel that, that, that what they believed before is not true anymore and that they can sometimes be very upset about that. Their response is to pull in the flippers, to, 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 to you know, and to, and their, their degree of, of advocacy advocacy or, or activism is to simply speak angrily about religion. 
right? Because they're still feeling the pain and the upset of what they've experienced. And they don't necessarily bounce back very quickly from that. You mentioned, you know, that it's taken a number of years of your decompression, right? And I understand that. What advice would you have or what do you think, um, you know, what, what, should you, what should we be talking about or telling people who are in that, that place, you know, to kind of help get them through that and maybe release some of that anger or let go of some of that and be able to come to a place of more tolerance or agreement or compassion or understanding or a willingness to communicate across the aisle? What, what's, what, how, what would you say about that? I think I would say two, two main things that we should say. Number one is, I understand you. And uh, particularly, especially me, because I was there, uh, and uh, I understand the, the pain. And I think the thing that we have to say to people is, just because you left religion doesn't mean you're done with your healing. And uh, there's a term I forget at this moment, but it's very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. People who come out of religion, they come out very messed up. And I would have used another word, but I don't know if it's allowed on the show. But it's very messed up. Uh, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> when Soviet then people come out very fucked up. They were they. When you come out of religion, it's this incredibly again earth-shattering moment because. You I, I, have you seen the movie Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah. Well, and if people, if, if, for if uh, I guess people who 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 grew up atheist, they probably don't understand this feeling. But if, if, to put it in that context, you know, Robin Williams, you know, he lost the kid, so he dresses up as a woman. He creates this character, Mrs. Doubtfire, to go into this family, uh, and then you know, he lives. People fall in love with Mrs. Doubtfire, and then come towards the end of the movie, the makeup comes down, and they realize, oh my gosh. Mrs. Darfar was made up the whole time and they're in shock. That's kind of the way it feels coming out of religion. Like this was your best friend, this whole thing that everyone talked about, you know, they, they, it, it becomes your, your identity. And all of a sudden it's a, it just turns out it's a huge lie. So even though you are able to leave it, that pain of one, yes, the anger because, oh, we were given a huge lie. Number two, my life was affected because I, for example, like me, I don't realize that I was gay, and that's a huge moment of loss. That's huge pain. Um, but third, there's this feeling of, of betrayal because we lost something that we loved, something that held our lives together. We lost it. Uh, so that's why I said number one, I said to the atheist community, I understand you. I hear you, and there's nothing I can say that is going to be more important than validating your pain and the sense of loss that you have because I know I felt it through, uh, too as well. Um, but I come down to number two and uh, understanding that pain, I try to organize my priorities. And I do this because I also, uh, I teach ethics. And to me it's very interesting. That's something that I've done with the Secular uh, Student Alliance. I teach ethics. Is there morality outside of religion? I believe there is a different conversation. Um, but part of those exercises is organizing your priorities, you know, and there's different levels. And there's a term that I use that some ethicists also use. It's called level zero. So, you know, there's this ethical dilemma, you know, and you put all the all your views. But at the very bottom, the one argument that holds everything together, even though you have a lot of hundred points, the bottom one, this is your, this is your punchline. This is where you want to end. This is your 10 second speech. This is your elevator you know, speech. And I said at the beginning. For me, humanism, or even humanity in general, it's about improving and saving lives. So once you accept, okay, this thing was completely wrong, it, it screwed up my life, so on and so forth, give yourself a time to heal. Accept the fullness, which is what I did. Oh my gosh, religion caused me to not realize I was gay. Religion caused me to not have a real career for a lot of people. Religion caused me to lose my family. Religion caused me da-da-da. And... Uh, go through that process of grieving and healing. But once that is through, remember that we're still on this earth and the time that we have left, why not use it for some good? So for me, I organize my priorities and that's what I recommend for everyone uh, who's going through that as well. Maybe for me, that is what it is. If we use something else, think about it. But if it's about improving and saving lives, then all the other crap that is on the top, I'll just make it fall through that. So if I go to a conference or if I put together events where I have the religious community, 
yes, getting even is uh, maybe somewhere on the list or maybe tell them, given a little piece of my mind, that might be on the list and so on and so forth. But my level zero comment is improving and saving lives. So if I can convince the Christian community to stop bashing or stop traumatizing other people, I think that is a win. If I can work with them and uh, be part of activists and supporting the black community, the Hispanic community, the so on and so forth uh, community, that is a step in the right direction. If we can prevent the pain and the bickering, the bitching that just happens between one another, and we focus on things of value that can uh, really improve our lives, that is a step in the right direction because people do not change their minds and their hearts overnight. It didn't happen to me. It's not going to happen with you. But I think in the step in the right direction is we say, guys, our humanity, what if it's about improving and saving lives? Then we're going in the right way. Excellent. Excellent. You have, um, from the talks that I've seen and, and you know, what I've read and, and seen from your, your communications in the past, you have um, pretty strong views about the atheist community and their responsibility to actually reach out to those in the religious community who are on the fence, who are doubting, who are struggling with their identity or their faith, um, because there are people out there who are in that situation. And they, they, they kind of say, you know, and sometimes those people clam up. They don't necessarily know who to talk to. They don't know what to say. They're, they're struggling. You've said that you, and you also, as we mentioned before, you want to create missionaries of reason. Let's, let's talk about this now. What do you want to see exactly? What would be the ideal for you in, in your work in this area? So missionaries of reason. One of the famous, one of the quotes that I keep putting out that I think people catch up on is that law, and I said this in the book as well, Love and reason should not love and thinking should loving and thinking should not be at odds. So love and reason cannot be enemies. What I mean by that, even as a scientist, even you know just a member of this human family, even looking through evolution, we know that emotion is part of the human experience. If you deny that, you're denying your mere humanity. Um, because of that pain that I talked about in the last, uh, during the last question, a lot of people, and I've seen this, there's, there's, they still have not gone completely applied through the, the healing process. Or, you know, again, their priorities are in a different order uh, than mine. Um, and they, they see the use of emotion to communicate as a way to backtrack and going back to, um, by going back to religion and giving them a space in their, in their, in their conversation. Uh, but, you know, and, and I say to them, Guys, I was Pentecostal. I spoke in tongues, cast a demon, and we literally, I remember a very famous phrase that we used there was, you know, God, I'm not going to listen to my head. I'm going to listen to my heart because that's where you're speaking. And I unfortunately did that for many years. So I get you. I get you that it just hap this happened, and people take advantage of emotion to convince them to go a different route, like Scientology or, you know, Pentecostalism or whatnot, so on and so forth. But what I tell people is, if you let them get away with that, you're giving them authority. You're given the power to call love as a, and a, to have a monopoly on love. And that goes against what we've seen through the history of humanity. Nonetheless, what I would say, even if like this, if the, my goal at the end of the, of the line is to improve and save lives, reason or knowledge is definitely my engine, but love is the method and the path that I use. Because, and we know this, if you want to talk about adrenaline, if you want to talk about endorphins or whatever else, that is a memorable way. Love is not just a little lovey-dovey, you know, kind of phrase, oh, let's all get together and so on and so forth. Love is a way, is a way of communication. Uh, it's a way to connect with someone. You look at them in the eye, you understand the pain, you hold someone's hand, you give them aid when it is, uh, when it is needed. That is part of the communication. If you believe that love is not a way or a method, maybe you just haven't explored the full capacity of what love is. Um, I was mentioned when I was, I was, uh, just spoke at the, um, the American Atheist Convention in South Carolina and, uh, people were really shocked and they, I was surprised like, oh, they've never heard a message like this. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? Be because I shared how I shared the, the death of my stepfather. Um, and I, there's another segment that is in the book as well. Um, he, he was electrocuted and I had to find the body and uh, it, was a, it was a very traumatic experience. Um, but I said in that moment when I was at my weakest, it was the religious community that came and said, 
let me help you. Uh, God can heal you, so on and so forth. And, and I'm like, where were the atheists? The atheists, they might have been marching somewhere, you know, towards my cause, but they were not there holding my hand. You know, they're allowing other people to call a monopoly on love, and they're the ones actually doing some of this loving. So what is my goal? Why missionary is a reason? I was a globetrotting missionary for the Pacific, and I was in Africa, I was in Latin America, I was in Asia, I was traveling all over the place, uh, doing all these things. I've learned that one, love is a human emotion that extends beyond religion. It's part of the human experience. But number two, um, because of that, they've been very organized. They, oh, here's the mission strips, here's the crusade, here's the discipling. So those skills, those processes, they actually work, not because there's a DET behind them, because those social constructs actually provide a positive result. So I would like to see when it comes to, again, Reason is the how it's going to be the engine, love is going to be the method, but the goal of there's to improve and save lives. So we say the atheist community, guys, let's do that. Let's go be uh, missionaries to that which we believe can actually improve and save lives, and that is this gospel of reason, and that's the reason why my website is called that. We have these news that can save lives, that can improve them. Equality, service, uh, charity, leadership, organization, structure, uh, all these elements, science, improvements, they can Im improve lives. So let's go ahead and use them. And I go, and uh, unfortunately, good thing, bad thing, the majority of the people that catch on to this message uh, it, are young people. Because uh, the millennial generation, they've grown up in the most diverse you know, generation. They're the most you know, diverse, civically engaged generation in American history. And they, uh, they're not too big on holding on to like the past. You know, They've grown up differently. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. And I, everywhere I go, I, you know, including with the Sickle Student Alliance, every time I talk to college students, they want to do that. They don't want to go to college just to become a per, uh, uh, to become some employee. They want to become a person. And if we don't provide those elements of service, of leadership, of training, of so on and so forth, they're going to go somewhere else where they can find them. So I'm saying, guys, atheist community, humanist community, wake up. Love is not something that just belongs to a particular group. It belongs to humanity. So I'm putting my flag on the ground and saying, this belongs to me as well. And I use that a way to communicate, not just about my life, the people in front of me, but let's provide some help because people are dying. You cannot, especially nowadays, you cannot turn on the TV without seeing another shooting, without seeing another hurricane, another earthquake, another dialogue, another war. We need people who step in the middle. March all you want and write papers if you want but get in the middle where people are bleeding, where people are crying, because that is what's going to make a difference. And what would that, and that, again, spot on, what would that look like for your average Joe? What, like, what is the call to action here? What is it that you would really like to see people doing? One of my other mantras or so that people have been catching on, I say, uh, thoughts and prayers are for show. Time and funds is how you prove and save lives. So that's another tangible. When you're religious, it's very easy to identify. Oh, the, the Christian fellowship for this and that, the Christian council for service that is very easy to identify. But when it comes to humanism, it's it's not a you know it's not a specific group that you can find them anywhere. So if I say like that, okay, they got you know thoughts and prayers and so forth, time and funds, you know, in that sense. So for average Joe, how do you do it? Let's start with the with, when it comes to let's start with the funds. Uh, that second part, the financing. You know, you see catastrophes happening, like uh, you know uh, the earthquakes in Mexico, the hurricanes in in, in, in America, the Caribbean. Uh, that's a way you provide for something that is happening. You send obviously a, um, a good uh, organization. Also, see the the Freedom from Religion Foundation has been doing uh, that activism as well. So that's a way. Second, you support especially for the older generation, you support the young people who are going to, who want to go on these, which is kind of what I, I was that young person. I was sponsored by churches and went out and did this missionarizing. So I would say the same thing. If you can go, uh, there's a phrase also we have in Mexico says, si tus pasos no van, van tus pesos. Pasos and pesos, like a plain word. So basically translated means if, you're, uh, if your steps can go, your pesos or your dollars will. So if you can go, then you send someone else who can do it. Second, that part, so time and funds. Funds is how you do it. You sponsor organizations or you sponsor people to go and do the service that you, that you can't do yourself. So on the, on, the, on the time, that's your investment. What I did out there in some of the best, most life-changing stories that I had in my time in evangelism was 
they were not when I was inside of the church, was when I was a missionary, when I was in Kenya working with the orphanage, when I was in, you know, Latin America building homes or helping first aid, when I was in, you know, whatever, Asia at Mount Teresa's Home for the Dying, and I saw the people that came in day in and day out seeking for help. People, I think, that was part, it's part ingrained in the culture of the religious community, but I think it's successful not because, again, there's a deity, but because of humanity. So when it comes to time, these organization guys helping and volunteering with uh, issues of human trafficking, with issues of um, the LGBT inequality, with issues of homelessness, Habitat for Humanity, so on and so forth. The, uh, the atheist community, we've gotten too comfortable with just sitting back and sometimes, yes, sending a dollar or two or going to the marsh once a year and so on and so forth. And we don't realize that this array of options are out there but we just don't know because they're not centralized. Again, and I love these organizations like, you know, the American Human Association or the, you know, the American, uh, all these other uh, humanist, atheist, agnostic kind of groups, but there's a lot of let's send a letter to Congress and so on and so forth, which again, they're useful. I'm not bashing them there. I think they're amazing. But when it comes to improving and saving lives in that moment, in that spot, when people need a hand, when we're crying and bleeding or lacking, so those civic engagement service organizations, that's a tangible way we can do. Send your funds directly, send someone to do it, or if you have the option, put it in your schedule once a, uh, once a year, so on and so forth. You get yourself, put yourself in that spot, uh, volunteering because of the hospices, again, orphanages, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, even, you know, uh, there's a lot of people now with hurricane and earthquake relief that they need people to go volunteer and go do it, donate blood, so on and so forth. I wish it was a lot more organized. I wish these giant uh, atheist organizations would have a foundation within that literally pushes, uh, pushes people, that they would have this missionary department like the one that I did at my college. We would send missionaries. Uh, you know, that, that's, that would be my perfect goal out here that these organizations, they have a subgroup uh, and that they, they train like we did with the missionaries. We train them, we teach them culture, we have them fundraise, we, get, we train them and then go out into a different place they build a home, they help out an orphanage, they go into a prison, they, you know, uh, they help out, they create camps for community and, you know, and psychological healing that we would be, that we would be, that we would be more intentional about improving and saving lives. That, I think, is a gospel worth living for. For sure. Absolutely. And I think you're hitting it uh, on the fact of uh, lack of organization is definitely an issue. What's your response to people like David Silverman who are very militant and, uh, you know, kind of in-your-face uh, atheists who, who don't tend to preach? I mean, I've had David on the show, right? And, he, and I've asked him about tolerance and br building bridges to religious groups who are on the same page when it comes to, say, matters of separation of church and state, uh, you know, on a legal front. There are religious groups who support that idea and who want to work with atheists to forward the legislative aspect of that, for example. And yet, I've, when, when, you, when I've talked with you know, some of the religious or some of the atheist leaders who head up these organizations to say, hey, why, don't, why aren't we working with these other groups? It's, it's sort of, there's a resistance. There's a, yeah, no, I don't want to be working with these guys. Or, yeah, no, that's not what we're doing or something, as though it's some kind of anathema to do that. What's your response to that? How do you think we, how should we be dealing with that sort of thing? A couple of things on that. One, uh, even when I, uh, not to keep going back to my book, which I think is a really good one, but. Uh, oh no, the reason, plug, plug away. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the reasons of, of why I wrote, because if you, a lot of, some of the comment that I've had, by the way, half the people that read, I think they're actually, they're religious. And most of the positive comment is coming out of uh, religious people because they saw my transition, not as this angry letter to, I hate you, you know, you're going to burn an atheist hell, but they saw it as a love letter, you know, like, mm -hmm. he, you know, it, it was, I explained with honesty how I wasn't, uh, why I was there and the love that I felt, but then I did explain, hopefully with enough respect, why I left it. Um, and I, and I asked them at the beginning and at the end, I still want to be part of your community. But the reason why I wrote it, because I, and I say this respectfully, I wanted my book to be the the, not necessarily the empty, but the other side of the coin to a Richard Dawkins, you know, or maybe the civil servant, like, because I do see it. And a lot of time people see this, you know, angry white atheist in the corner shouting, you're going to go to atheist hell, you know, type of thing. So I was like, you know what? I, I, I was mentioning earlier uh, that I, you know, because I'm also an ethicist. I, I teach ethics. I love ethics. 
I love leadership theory. That's where my, edu my education was, and that's what I teach. And in leadership theory, we know that people have at least four different venues of expressing their leadership into others. Um, and you know, not to go full on into it, but some people lead through order and, and structure, some people lead through charisma, um, some people lead through relationship, and some people lead through facts and knowledge. So when I look at people, I am no one to tell, again, Richard Dawkins or David Silverman or some of these other, I don't want to say this, you know, angry white atheists, but these people have this, uh, this vision. Because for their personality, plot this, you know, kind of like structure, I think that's kind of what they are. It works for them. Uh, and for a lot of people, they use the other. A lot of people use the method that is natural for them, that, that they feel comfortable with, they feel power uh, in that. For me, I find myself in that kind of like second one, which is called, uh, if you've, if anyone's taken that call, it's called the true colors uh, in a personality test. For me, I realize my, I've taken the test. For me, it shows that I, I'm able to teach through charisma and through connection. You know, I put, I put, I put thoughts into words and I can communicate through, through that emotional venue. It works for me. So a lot of times when we're asking these other people like the Silvermans or the Dawkins of the world and so forth, if I'm telling them, it's kind of like telling the monkey, can you please go swim? Or can you tell the eagle, please run? Or, you know, any of those things. So what I'm telling people is find your skills, your skill set. Is a structure order great? If it's if it's uh, um, you know uh, charisma and energy, if it's relationship or knowledge, find what you're good at. Take some of these personality tests and and know your strengths and 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 and, and channel your energy through those. That's what I did. But second, don't stop there. Find other people's strengths and use them. So, for example, they, they, I would say to the Dawkins and Silvermans, what you're doing may be great, but at best it's incomplete because the narrative of the human experience is way more than that. It works good for you and you find passion when you communicate like that, but you're maybe leaving three-fourths of the population outside. So what I do with me, I bring people that... I like smart people who disagree with me in, and also on the style. So I, I tell people, like, again, the Dawkins or Silvermans, add people like Fernando, add people that, uh, that have other gifts of communicating than you do, you know? Unfortunately, it's one of the things that I've seen, not just in atheism, but I've seen it in politics and religion. And a lot of times, that gold personality, the... Um, Again, structure, order, this is the way, you know, kind of, you know, they tend to be the ones higher up in leadership um, just because they come across as the ones that, again, order and structure, what more of a managerial skill could it look like? But that is one of the biggest misconceptions in leadership. And the other three sometimes get left on the side. So I, I've, I've tried to learn how to communicate with the, uh, the other groups. So I'm saying people. Don't sacrifice the human experience. There's a bunch of other people, and I think a role as leaders is be able to identify that. Let's bring them in, the people who lead differently than we do, because they're going to help us reach out to people who are different than us, you know, who, right. who listen and learn differently than we do. Exactly. I think the challenges in the atheist community are the, 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 the perception, for one, uh, because survey, at least according to surveys, you know, the atheists are – are more badly regarded in the United States than than is you know Islamic terrorists. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty bad. And I think that angry white male thing has something to do with that, you know. And I think also the 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 and it's a challenge because, like I mentioned earlier in the show, people come out of religion and they are angry because they feel they they have a paradigm shift or a, or a you know a deconversion, and they look at you know all the years and 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 dogma and things that they accepted and they go. Well, that just doesn't work for me anymore, and it so much doesn't work that actually it was I wasted all that time, and they are angry, and they need to deal with that anger. But I think that when we're talking about a movement, I, I think I'm on the same page as you as far as like we need to be building those bridges and reaching out and working with others <clears throat> because that is the best way to go about helping people. You okay. know? My, 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 again, organizing the things – my level zero, um, it is not to bring down religion. Uh, my level zero is to improve and save lives. And I think when you put things in a different perspective, the stars start you know, to align in a different direction. So I think, again, 
what I keep telling uh, to the community, again, I'm, I respect your, your journey. Uh, and I even, I, the, the reason why I even picked that title for To Lacrosse and Back is because I know that we're all on a journey. It's a path, you know, for me it was, and I eventually came back. Uh, so we're on a journey, but that journey is not just about deconverting. That journey is also about healing. That journey is about, you know, learning to communicate with, with people who are different and finding your own vision within that. So I, I tell people, if you find it within you, put those part. just think about it. what were your top 10 priorities uh, in life? Okay, bringing down religion could be one of them or so on and so forth, but is that more important than improving and saving lives, you know? Uh, and if that's not, maybe put it up and move them around. And if this is the level zero, this is the most important thing out here, then you're gonna see it doesn't really matter whom I work with because I'm not, here to attack the, you know, the Christians or the Muslims or the Buddhists or the, you know, so on and so forth. I'm here to improve lives. And at this point, this, you know, um, common denominator that we all have, we are humans who bleed, who cry, who need, who thirst, who hunger. Um, and that's something that can definitely unite us because it's not bring down anyone. It's about improving. And I think, like I was saying, a lot of people change their minds about um, gays and lesbians and whatnot because they met someone. Uh, and they realized that these were good people, you know, uh, and I think it happens with the same way. If you if someone meets an atheist who cares about humanity as much as they do, they're going to say, you know what? It is not this particular atheist that is making them the you know, angry, wise, angry white atheist in the corner shouting, go to uh, atheist hell. Uh, but it's, it's a human who cares about the same things that I do. And that makes you see someone as part of your community. And you cannot raise your hand or you know, your anger against someone who's part of a different community. If love is our motto, that you can communicate with that. It doesn't need a language or a culture. It just speaks for itself. Excellent. You clearly are behind the idea of activism um, as an atheist, and there are atheists, more than a couple I've seen over the last couple of years, who push back on that simply on the principle of hey, look, the only thing that we all got in common is a lack of belief in God as the atheists, right? Um, and I'm not into this whole social justice thing or activism thing. Um, and they kind of treat atheism more as a social activity or something. Um, you know, it's a, it's a common platform from which they can communicate to others. But when in terms of actually going out and doing something, yeah, no, no, not so much, you know. What's your response to that? I mean, I'm surely you've run into some resistance in that form over the time that you've been talking about this. Yes, uh, there's a lot of people. I, I guess I would say that even more than a social group, I think for, uh, for a significant percentage of the atheist community is that they see their atheism as an intellectual exercise, a way to find right. that or a, a way to find out how much the, the other side is wrong. Uh, so in that sense, I think, again, I definitely don't have a problem with academic research or whatnot because that's what led me out of uh, a religion. But I keep saying it's not that it's wrong, it's just that it's incomplete. So the fullness of the human experience in, involves a lot more elements than just learning more. Uh, you know, at the end, we need community. At the end, we need survival. At the end, we need something to feed our uh, emotional, psychological aspect, you know, of our humanity. So the intellectual, I think, again, it's kind of like when, you know, they say a good diet is not just the absence of one thing, but it's a good combination of everything. It's the same way, way with your humanity. The intellectual exercise is a great thing. Let's become smarter. Let's write papers, so on and so forth. Um, but don't sacrifice the other parts because you're going to, like what happens, people just go on a particular diet, you know, uh, one of the things I remember my English professor said, the thing with diet, you know, is die, and then you put a cross on it. It's like, oh, that makes sense with the word diet. So I think it's the same way. If you, if you, if you go into a diet of your human experience, you're going to get sick. You're going to become like uh, incomplete. You're not going to be the healthiest. And anger, my friends, uh, it is a consequence of, you know, bad mental health or emotional health, you know, this anger, this so on and so forth. So say, when it comes to the diet, because um, I don't want you to die, uh, it's, it's that. What are the other elements of the human experience? Granted, some of those elements like activism or community or the emotion might have been used and very often overused in the religious community, but they do not have an ownership of those. They belong to humanity. So if you can explore them, you know, what are those elements? Because they're going to feed into you. And they, honestly, they're going to feel a lot more complete. 
they did to me, they're reaching out to, I mean, this is a message that is, is resonating with a lot of, of people. I mean, I spoke at the last, again, America's Atheist Convention, and people were telling me afterwards, Fernando, there wasn't a dry uh, eye in the room. Uh, and, and I'm just surprised, like, oh my gosh, how is this possible that for a group of, you know, long-time atheists, this is a message that is, is like, you're discovering the wheel, you know, like the iPhone of atheism uh, for some reason. And I'm thinking there's something that has always been there. It's not because it's not part of the human experience, but we were trained into no emotion, malo, malo, you know, uh, or anything else. That's right. I say, even as research, let me put it like that. You know what? We're scientists, right? Uh, we want to, and part of that, it means experimentation. Give it a shot. Try that part of humanity that's been locked in there. Communicate with people that are different than you. Use, uh, organize your priorities and put uh, improving and saving lives of at the bottom and see how that changes your shift as to how you're going to communicate with people and leave your, your mark on the world. Yeah, very good point. I think, uh, I think you're hitting the nail on the head there in regards to the, um, the um, resistance to emotion uh, that, that in, you know, in treating atheism as an intellectual exercise because they correctly see that religion is very, very emotion-based. People do not reason their way into dogmatic belief. They feel their way to it. It's what feels good, and and it's not. And and I don't. I'm not saying that in a derogatory fashion, uh, but a lot of atheists do, and they'll treat that emotional response or that feel good as inherently bad or wrong or something. And and what you're speaking to is is no. Let's let's bring some of that emotional connection back into the atheist world as well. And I I really fully support that. On the opposite side, what sort of resistance have you run into in what you do in trying to build bridges or mend fences or work with uh, religious groups? What sort of pushback have you had from that quarter? That reminds me almost, again, the phrase that I, that I mentioned when I was in Utah. And uh, that it was just fine. Honestly, people who are not Mormon, they would tell me a lot of you know, things that seems that they tell everybody who was Gone. But one of those things that people said, Fernando, you cannot be, you cannot be liked and popular uh, and get away with it, and not, and and not be Mormon and get away with it. Mm. So I, there's there's this fear in religion, not just in Mormonism, other branches of Christianity, that if they see a success, quote unquote, or you know something that works out without religion, it provides a little bit of fear in them because oh my gosh if you can be loving and successful and you know and in an activism without god that then why do you need god for you know type of thing so i think there's definitely that um second and i think it i was mentioning the reason with mrs doubtfire you know th this whole system was built around this nanny you know the mother knew that she could go away and the kids would be there there would be you know uh, taking care of not just their physical needs, but their emotional needs and so forth. And then this person disappears, their whole life falls apart. So with a lot of religion, when they see some kind of introduction of atheism or lack of, uh, of theism uh, ism into it, they feel that their faith is being diluted. Um, they feel, you know, because it, it's a fear because when, when atheists come in, they're not necessarily going to open up in prayer. They're not going to necessarily thank God for everything that they do. They're not going to, you know, call, put the word Christian on top of everything else. They're not going to put their symbol across everything else. So there's this view that it's going to dilute their um, their identity. But I say that I honestly, I mentioned the same thing to them that I mentioned with the other. If you put your priorities in order, if it's about improving and saving lives, uh, isn't that something that is going to make you and your community or would not make your deity more possible, uh, more, uh, you know, the possibility, and it's like, it, it is true. But going back to the other point that I was saying, when they see someone who speaks, I don't want to say like Christianese, but someone who speaks human, uh, that's a common denominator for everyone else, and that they, they can understand it. Uh, I have a friend, a close friend, that every time we talk, it's like, he just asked, he's a, he's a, he's a gay Christian. Um, and he's not even from this country, but he, he just keeps asking me questions like, so atheists do this. So how does a conference look like an atheism if you don't raise your hands and so on and so forth? If it, so, so, forth. so it's been very interesting to see this communication. And when I express what it is, he realizes, oh my gosh, these are human experiences. Those, these are human exercises, whatever we do. And he understands in his own context, he understands what that's like. 
So I think at the end, either atheist or uh, theist, the communication is, communication is the same. Uh, kind of like sometimes you can speak language, uh, English all over the world uh, because it's kind of a popular language. Humanity, humanism, is a language that whatever belief you can understand, you can connect with it. Yep, I get it. Totally get it. And uh, again, agree completely. That's, that's excellent. Um, all right, well, we're going to wrap up now. So I wanted to, again, repeat that your website is gospelofreason.com, and your book is To the Cross and Back, An Immigrant's Journey from Faith to Reason. Where do people go to get that book? They can find it there on the site, uh, you know, Gospel of Reason, click on book. Uh, you can also find it on Barnes & Noble. You can find it on, uh, you know, iTunes. You can find it on Amazon, and uh, it's available. You can get the uh the printed version or the digital version, uh, and if you have the next conference, I'll sign it for you. Uh, but it goes even just on that uh, on that book for people to know. Um, one of the things that that I like, and if you see some of the feedback that I also have there on the website, one of the things that I feel proud of, and again, this was a very difficult book to write because I, again, I decided that that was going to be my venue. Reason is my engine. My goal is to improve and save lives, and my method is connect emotionally with my, uh, with my, with my reader. Uh, and I invested again, my deepest, darkest secrets and also pains. You know, I talk about, um, sexual abuse that I suffered as a child. I talk about physical abuse that I had as a child. I talk about my suicide tendencies throughout adolescence. I talk about the, um, my struggle with uh, identifying my sexuality. I talk about the absence of a father figure me because my father abandoned me when I was a fetus and, he reappeared later in life, and, and a little traumatic thing there. I, you know, I talk about the uh, the death of my stepfather. I talk about a uh, accidents that I had, like I fell off a cliff and was paralyzed to learn learn how to walk again. Wow. So all these segments that talk about elements of the human experience is not it, uh, to the cross and back. It is not a I hate God book per se. It is not a NT. This is how it, I put simply humanity front and center. And part of that experience is religion, part of that, you know, but the other elements are, you know, loss, pain, joy. Uh, and that is a book for people simply to say, you know what, I'm not alone in this world. Someone else has gone through that as well, and I can make it happen. And if anything, hopefully at the end, people will be inspired to be able to be somewhat of that missionary of reason, that they can go into their lives and say, you know what, I am not alone. Even if they believe something else, we're part of this little boat that keeps traveling around the sun, you know, um, year by year. And I'm sharing this, you know, boat for them for, 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 for the rest of my, my life. Why not make it a better one? Because once I invest in them, automatically means investing in me. And that's not just done with money or with marches or reading and writing another paper. It's because you were holding someone's hand when they were at their worst when you were building that home, when they didn't have a place to go, you know, when you look them in the eye and you make them feel that they were not alone. Let's get on this boat together. That is my story, but I know, and I know that your listeners will also have a desire to write their own. Big time. Yeah, I think people are going to be very interested in your journey and, and what you have to say in that after our, our talk here. And I certainly hope, I definitely encourage everyone to check out his website, gospelofreason.com and uh, and your book. Thank you very much for coming around. Is there any other way that people might reach out to you? Do they do it through your website or is there any other? Uh, what's your what's your handle on Twitter? Uh, Fernando Moshe. It's M-O-S-H-E-H. It was an all funny story in the book as well. Uh, it was, I changed, it means Moses in Hebrew. Uh, but in, I, 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 when I became a U.S. citizen, I was able to change my name. And I explained in the book why I changed it. Uh, but I left it, I left, I, I left it as my, because again, I am not a religious person anymore, but that context of Moses, who was this, you know, he was put into the boat by, you know, the Hebrews and he was raised by the Egyptians, raised as an Egyptian. And then he came as an Egyptian to, you know, raise, uh, to save his people. So I was like, you know what, in this sense, again, I'm not religious, but I like that concept of, I was raised as a religious person, you know, uh, and then uh, was able to come back. And now I'm using the knowledge that I have in atheism to reach out to the religious community, to reach out to everyone, bring them back out here. So 
I thought, you know what, it's symbolic, uh, but that's what it is. Uh, hashtag Fernando Moshe, M-O-S-H-E-H, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All those links are also on gospelofreason.com, and there's a content page that uh, you can send me a message to. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you again for, for being on board here. Folks, leave, leave us your feedback. I would very much like to hear your responses to the things we talked about here, your own experiences with this, whether you're an atheist or a person of faith, how you've, uh, what kind of interactions you've had with people of the opposite camp, and what, you, what as suggestions or ideas you might have as to how we might build bridges and, and mend fences and, and create, um, you know, uh, commonality rather than divides because that's what this show is all about and that's what I think uh, Fernando's efforts are all about. So, um, all right, guys, we will see you guys next week. Thanks for coming around. Bye-bye.